فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا دا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا على سيد المرسلين وإمام المتقين ورحمة الله للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى كل من صار على نهجه واقتفى أثره إلى يوم الدين وبعد إن شاء الله تعالى today we're going to be starting with the permission of Allah سبحانه وتعالى the biography of the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم and there is no biography greater to be spoken about than the biography of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام my beloved brothers and sisters the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's biography has a great importance to every Muslim. He is a role model we, 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 in which we were commanded to follow alayhi salatu wa sallam. And he is an evidence for us, a proof. But as you all are aware of, the biography of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is like history. It's a portion of history. And history is something that the peace people pass on to each other, statements and speeches they tell each other. And sometimes they add things to it that are not part of it. So the Prophet Sallallahu biography has endured some false accusations and lies. People have added to the Prophet's biography that which is not from it. And that which the Prophet didn't say nor did he come into contact with Alayhi Salatu, Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. Al-Imam Muhafid al-Iraqi, he said in his Nadhm al-Sirah, فَلْيَعْلَمِ الطَّالِبُ أَنَّ السِّيرَةً Let the student of knowledge know that the biography of the Prophet تَجْمَعُ مَا صَحَّ وَمَا قَدْ أُنْكِرَ It has gathered false information that have been added to it and things that are true. So inshaAllah ta'ala, I as an individual will try my best Everything I say about the Prophet's biography, it's something that's authentic and nothing that is false and that has no evidence. Inshallah ta'ala, before we start the biography, we will take a couple of points. <laughs> Point number one, the importance of the Prophet's biography. Zainu al-Abideen Ali ibn al-Husayn ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib radhi Allahu ta'ala anhu. This is Ali's grandson. So he's Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he said, Kunna nu'allamu maghaziya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We were taught the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's biography. We were taught it. Wa sarayahu and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's expeditions. Kama nu'allamu suratan min al Quran, the way that we will be taught a surah from the Quran. We would study the Prophet's biography just like we would study a surah in the Quran. And the companions are comparing the Quran to the Prophet's biography because the Quran was something that you all know how you should be memorizing it and learning it. That's how the Prophet's biography was. We would study it and we would learn it like a surah from the Quran. Ismail ibn Muhammad ibn Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, who is a grandson of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. He said, Kana Abi Yuallimuna. My father Muhammad ibn Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, he used to teach us Maghazi Rasulillah, the Prophet's biography. Wayaqulu and he would say to us when he tells us about the biography, Ya Baniya, my children, Hadi Ma'athiru Abaikum. This is the footprints and the footsteps of your forefathers. Fala tu dayyudikraha. Don't forsake the mentioning of it. These are your role models. These are the people you need to tread on their paths. Don't forsake it and don't dismiss it. And today, because youngsters and many Muslims are ignorant about the Prophet's biography, they've taken other people as their role model. They've taken other people, singers, rappers, artists, and etc. They've taken them as role models. Al Imam Khatib al Baghdadi, he said, تتعلق بمغازي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أحكام كثيرة فيجب كتبها وَالْحِفْظُ لَهَا And Imam Al-Khatib Al-Baghdadi, he said, The Prophet's biography 
has a lot of rulings connected to it. Just by studying his biography, as you're all going to see, amazement. If you want to live as a father, you're going to know how to live as a father. If you want to live as a leader, you will know how to live as a leader. If you want to be a son, every single majal, everything you want to be, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a role model, role model for you in it. It's the Prophet's biography in how you learn, in how he dealt with those who were around him, alayhi salatu wasalam. How he dealt with his wives and how he treated them. How he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he dealt with the disbelievers and etc. This will give you an understanding by studying the Prophet's biography, you will, know, you will learn all of that and you will come to know all of that. Al-Imam ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah, he said, wa aslul usul al-ilm, the fundamental foundation of knowledge is, wa anfa'ul ulum, and from one of the greatest knowledge to study, an-nadaru fi siyar al-rasuli, looking at the Prophet's biography, wa ashabihi and his companions, qala Allah ta'ala, Allah said in the Quran, ulaika al-ladheena, these are the ones, had Allah, Allah guided them, fabihudahu muqtadih, Follow them in their footsteps. These are the ones Allah guided. Allah guided Abu Bakr. Allah promised Abu Bakr Jannah whilst he was walking on this earth. All he needed to get to Jannah to was to die. Umar the same. Uthman and Ali. These are who Allah has guided. So Allah says to us in that verse, Follow them in their guidance. So you can all see how important it is to study the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's biography. And these ulama have stated it clearly, the importance of the Prophet's biography. I'm now going to move on to the distinct characteristics, I mean the distinct things that our Prophet's biography has over every other Prophet that came. Nabiullah Muhammad, his biography is unique. There's no one like it. Nabiullah Muhammad, his biography is unique. And it's unique in the following. Number one, it is the most authentic biography of any prophet that has ever been sent. His biography is the most authentic. It's been transmitted with an authentic chains of narrations. Asanid, the previous nations, they didn't have chains of narration. And so when they transmit things about, مثلا, Isa ibn Maryam, they are telling you what they think, I and mean, what their parents have told them, or the priest has told them, or the Pope said. They don't have chains for it. Our Prophet والسلام, his biography is authentically transmitted to us. Salawatullahi wa salamuhu Number two. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's biography is the most clearest biography in regards to any Prophet. Even those Prophets, we don't have every stage of their lives. Our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's biography is clear in every stage. We know him Alayhi Salatu Wasallam the day he was born, where he was born, the women who breastfed him, his parents' names, name, his father and mother's name, and his father's name, we know it. We know him, sallallahu alayhi wa his dad and his father's name and where his father was born. We know his mother and where she was born. We know about him, alayhi salatu wa salam, his childhood and how he grew up. We know him, alayhi salatu wa salam, as a youth, as a shab in Mecca and how he was. We know that. We even know how his income was and what his income was, what he made money from. Before Islam, we know it. Brothers, if you can sit here, inshallah ta'ala. Brothers, if you just came to sit here, inshallah. We know what he made money from before Islam. Before he got money, before he became a prophet, how was his income? And where was he making money from? We know it. We know where he traveled to when he left Mecca. Alayhi salatu was salam. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent him as a messenger and as a prophet. My beloved brothers and sisters, we even know how he ate. What did Imam Muslim narrate in Sahih? That Ibn Ka'b ibn Malikin, from his father Ka'b ibn Malikin, what did he say? 
رأيت النبي I saw the Prophet of Allah يلعق أصابعه I saw the Prophet um, suck his fingers after he ate we know how he ate we know he ate through three fingers عليه الصلاة والسلام أبي جحيفة he said I saw the Prophet of Allah صلوات الله والسلام عليه and the Prophet said to him إني لا أكل متكئة I never eat lying down so we know how he ate we even know about him, he, how he stood and how he sat. When he sat, alayhi salatu salam, he would cross his feet, alayhi salatu salam, and he would face towards the qibla, generally when he spoke. We know about him, his clothing and the clothes that he wore. We even know how he spoke. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she saw some people talking. And then she said, Inna Rasulullah lam yakun yasrudul haditha kasardikum. The Prophet's speech was not like your speech, where you just go on. He was. Ida takallama bi kalimatin, if he spoke a speech, a'adaha thalatan, he would repeat himself three times. Alayhi salatu wasalam, hatta tufham anhu, so the people can understand him. We know how he dealt with his family and his wives. Aisha said, I went with the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day in one of his travelings. وَأَنَا جَارِيَةٌ I was very young in age. لَمْ أَحْمِلِ اللَّحْمَ And I wasn't weighted nor was I chubby or fat. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said to the people تَقَدَّمُوا He said to the army go forward, go move. All of you go forward. So the army left. And so the Prophet is left with his wife Aisha. And then he said to her, Aisha, Ta'ali hatta usabiquki. Come, let's race. Let's who's faster, me or you. You have to imagine. He said, Allah has a whole army of men with their food in the middle of nowhere. And he tells all of them, move. All of you go. Just to put happiness in our heart. He said, Aisha, let me race with you. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and she said, Fasabaktuhu, I raced him. فَسَبَقْتُ and I beat him. I won. He lost, alayhi salatu salam. فَسَكَتَ عَنِّي He went quiet. He didn't say anything to me. He just went quiet. She was happy because she won. So the Prophet sallallahu he looks for the right time. حَتَّى إِذَا حَمَلَتِ اللَّحْمَةِ Until she became chubby. وَبَدُنَتْ And she was waited. وَنَسِيَتْ And she forgot. So, رضي الله تعالى عنها. She said, خَرَجْتُ مَعَهُ I came out with him. فِي بَعْضِ أَسْفَارِ In one of his travels. Ya, my beloved brothers and sisters, this is a man who is going through the hardest time in his life. He's going through the most serious matters. He's the one who has to run the Muslim affairs. He has to convey message of Islam. And everything, and he still doesn't remember a race. It says a lot. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he said to Aisha, let, come, let me race you after he told the army to move forward. And then he said, Ta'ali usabiquki. Fasabaktuhu fasabakani. This time he won. Fajala yadhaku. The Prophet started to laugh at Aisha. And then he said to her, Hadihi bitilk. This is for the previous one. And he never raced with her again, not to hurt her. To make it for her to feel is equal. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't give her another challenge. And this shows you what he was. And no prophet has been brought to us his life like this. We also even know his ibadah and his prayer. Mughirat ibn Shu'bah narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prayed until his legs swole. It became very, very uh, swollen. Aisha then said to him, O Messenger of Allah, are you going to burden yourself to this extent that you're going to pray at night until your legs are swollen this much? And Allah has forgiven you for your past sins and your coming sins. You're free. There's no mistakes and no, no sins on your scale. And the Prophet said, أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا I am, and, and why shouldn't I be a slave who shows gratitude to his Lord? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we know his prayer. We even know how he dealt with his companions, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, and how he was towards them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he would mix with his companions, and he would sit. Anas ibn Malik, and he said, in kana nabiyyu la yukhalituna, the Prophet would sit with us on the floor, and he would mix with us. Hatta yaqulu li akhi, li akhi li sagirin, that the Prophet said to one of my young brothers, Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'ala nughayr? Aba Umair, what did your bird nughayr do? He was laughing, min bab al muda'aba. And this hadith alone, one of the great imams, he extracted a hundred benefits from it. Just that statement of the Prophet, Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'ala nughayr? Walidhalika the Prophet, he would joke with the companions. And even then when he would joke, he said about himself, Inni la aqulu illa haqqa. When I'm joking, I don't say except the truth. Everything I am uttering is the truth. When he would even joke with his companions and his wife. My beloved brothers and sisters, we have reached the level of knowing the Prophet Sallallahu that we even know how many white hair was in his beard and in his hair. And Imam Muhammad narrated in his Musnad, Ibn Hibban in his Sahih, on the authority of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhum, he said, Ma adattu fi ra'si Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa lihiyati. I counted the Prophet's hair and his beard, the number of white hair that was in it. Illa arba'ata ashara sha'aratan bayda. He only had 14 white hair. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So our messenger of Allah, our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we know everything about him. We know everything. There is to know about a prophet. Well, a summary of what can be said about him is that he was born under the scope. He was born as though a camera was 24 hours watching him. The way his life was documented, documented us and brought forward. The third unique thing that we have in the prophet's biography and the studying of the prophet's biography is the biography of the prophet it informs us of an individual who Allah honored him. Allah honored him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This honoring that he has been given, it has not taken him out of being a human being. He's been honored with a message and a prophecy. But it hasn't taken him out from being a human being. He married. Sallallahu alayhi He even divorced. He got pleased and he got angry. He bought and he sold. He is a human being. ما في هذه الكلمة من معنى. What the word human being carries, he is a human being. Not like how the Christians make their prophet, Isa ibn Maryam. If he is an ilah, how can he be a role model to you? And how can you follow him? But our prophet, he is a human being. He would be happy and he would be angry. He would buy and he would sell. Alayhi salatu, alayhi salatu wasalam. He also He also is a role model for us and we were told to follow him. Laqad kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana liman kana yarju Allah wal yawm al akhirah wa dhakara Allah kathira. The fourth unique Beauty in the Prophet's biography is his biography is what allows us to understand that he truly is a messenger sent from Allah and a Prophet. By studying the Prophet's biography, alayhi salatu wasalam, looking at what he accomplished in 23 years, Ya ikhwa, 23 years, what he accomplished and what he gained could not have been attained and it could not have been gained except from a person who is directly being helped and aided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 10 years he was in Mecca, only 13 years he did what he did. That's when he actually became a leader. 
and he was in charge of somewhere. 13 years. 13 years, alayhi salatu wasalam, what he accomplished. And the things that he came forward with. How he, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, he sat his companions down. And that he, they would listen to him attentively. They wouldn't disobey him. If he told them to stand up, they would stand up. If he told them to sit down, they would sit down. Not because they feared him. Not because they were scared of him. Not because he had an army. Because they loved him, alayhi salatu wasalam. Because they admired him, alayhi salatu wasalam. His da'wah reached the outskirts of Mecca, the outskirts of Medina. It went to the neighboring countries, alayhi salatu wasalam. The patience which he endured, alayhi salatu wasalam, shows that the issue was bigger for him than himself. It was bigger to him than Muhammad alone. But that this for him was prophecy and a message that he had to convey. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Innahu wallahi, Nabi Allah Muhammad is a true prophet sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah aided him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah physically aided him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he aided him with the Quran and the evidences that he gave him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, inshallah ta'ala, Let's talk about Jaziratul Arabiya fil Asri al Jahili. Before the Prophet came, how was the Arabian, Arabian Peninsula? How was it like? And how did it look? The Arabs, before Islam came to them, their moral morality and their etiquette was downhill. They were indulged into khamr, alcohol, and gambling. And it reached a level of qaswa and evilness. It reached to the extent that they buried their daughters alive. Ila wa'dil banat. Adultery and fornication was on the rise. People's safety was on the line. You would take a path and a road and you were 90% your caravan and whatever you're carrying would ta be taken and it would be robbed from you. A, a highway robber will take it, away, take it from you. This was the situation of the Arabs. Let's take example for them. For example, Shubh al Khamr. Drinking alcohol, it was spread. To the extent that a person wouldn't sit on a table or a, a food would not be served on a table unless khamar was there and alcohol was there. It was rooted in the community. They used to just come together just to have alcohol. If they ate, they would have the alcohol as the starters. And when they left the gathering, they would drink alcohol to leave the gathering. They even spoke about alcohol in their poetries. Labid ibn Rabi'at al-Amiri, he's from the Ihd al-Mu'allaqati al-Sab'a, from one of the seven whose poetry was connected to the Kaaba, how much they respected it, and it was written in ink of gold. They respected it. These are called al-Mu'allaqati al-Sab'a, the seven poets. He says, قَدْ بِتُّ سَامِرَهَا وَغَايَةُ تَاجِرٍ وَافَيْتُ إِذْ رُفِعَتْ وَعَزَّ مُدَامُهَا he refers to the alcohol as trading. Like all of business and money making is alcohol. If alcohol is not business, then what is business? That's how much alcohol was for them. Qatadat ibn Da'amat al-Sudusi said, Kana al-rajulu fil jahiliya. Which is the second thing. Qimar. Which is gambling. They used to gamble. They will gamble their cars, their, uh, sorry, their, their, their riding beasts, their horses and their camels, their properties, their children and their wives was part of the gambling. وَلِذَلِكَ قَتَادَ said, كَانَ الرَّجُلُ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ That a man before Islam, يُقَامِرُ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ وَمَالِهِ He would bring his children and his family and his wealth forward. فَيَقْعُدُ حَرِيبًا سَلِيبًا And if he lost the gambling, his wife and children, everything would be taken from him and his wealth. 
يَنظُرُ إِلَى مَالِهِ You will see his whole wealth and everything he owned taken away from him. فَكَانَ تُورِثُ بَيْنَهُمْ عَدَاوَةً وَبُغْضًا And this is what placed in their hearts hate and enmity towards one another. That's why they fought and they fought. Somebody just took your children and your wealth. This is where it reached. And the reason I'm telling you all of this, my beloved brothers and sisters, is the argument that many use, the Qur'an cannot relate to me. The religion cannot relate to the problems that our community are facing. You're ignorant about the Arabs and the way they were. Exactly what they are going through is what we are going through today. Maybe because we have technology, but the reality is the same problems and the same shaitan that was sending revelation on those ones is the same one that's sending revelation on these ones today. Riba spread. The people of the Arabian Peninsula, they used to trade in riba. And it was very well spread. That it was excessive and it was exaggerated. And Imam Ibn Jarir al-Tabari said, كَانَ الْرِبَا فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ The riba before Islam, it was فِي التَّضْعِيفِ وَفِي السِّنِينِ It was on multiplying it and doubling it. If a person was given debt, it would be multiplied. If the time comes and you don't pay, it was multiplied. And it was multiplied. And it was multiplied. The man who would come to you, who gave you the money, and he will say to you, تَقْضِي are you going to give me back your, my money? Oh, or are you going to increase it? And if he says, okay, I'll increase it. If he has it, he'll give it. And if he doesn't, he'll say, next year I'll come to you, inshallah ta'ala, this time. If what he took from him was, methalan, Ibn to Makhadin. Ibn to Makhad is a goat that's two years. If it's two years, he would come and he would want from him the next year Ibn Talabunin. Well, that's three years. And then it will go on. It will become a jad'a. It will beca- then it will turn into a ruba'iyan. It will just grow. It will be a whole uh, camel now. And then it will go, the camel will be four years, and it will, etc. It will just multiply. If it was gold that you, he gave you, then that same gold will multiply, so it becomes two. And then you didn't bring it, it becomes four. And then it becomes eight. And then it becomes 60, and it goes on. It will just multiply until you pay it. It was their trading, and this was what their life was like. That a person, years would go by, and he has no way to pay. Zina spread. It was one of the most prominent things in the community. And rather, it was غير مستنكرين. No one was out there to stop them from doing it. It was part of their norms. Rather, they used to have boyfriends and girlfriends. They had boyfriends and girlfriends. And the Quran mentions it. Which is Al-Khalilat. The person has, as Allah mentions in the Quran, وَلَا مُتَّخِذَاتِ أَخْذَانِ مَا مَعْنَى مُتَّخِذَاتِ أَخْذَانِ Girlfriends. They had it. Not only that, the women also had boyfriends. It was normal. It was common. And they would burden their slaves, if they had slaves, to go commit. They would make them do prostitution. They would make them do prostitution and bring that money. So they tell their slave girl, go, open one of those um, uh, uh, prostitution house and go and commit zina. Bring money home for me. Now it's a pimp, right? So he pimps the slave and he wants money from her. So she has to go and she has to bring money. And Imam al-Bukhari narrated in his sahih, on the authority of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, أَنَّ النِّكَاحَ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَةِ That the, the nikah here means the intimacy. Not their marriage, the intimacy. Before Islam was four. And she mentions one, the last four, the last one, which is the one that concerns us. She says, A woman would open a prostitution house and the men would gather there. They would come in line to her to commit zina with her. 
And Aisha said, وهن, وهن, and they are the bagaya. These women were prostitutes. And no one would stop her. No one would say what you're doing is wrong. وَلِذَلِكَ Allah said in the Quran, وَلَا تُكْرِهُ فَتَيَاتِكُمْ عَلَى الْبِغَاءِ Do not force your daughters and your women into prostitutions. In Aradna, if they wish and they want tahassunan, if they want to be chast, لِتَبْتَغُوا عَرَضَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Don't force them into it. وَلِذَلِكَ الْإِمَامْ مَالِكْ narrated in his Muatta, بِسَنَدٍ صَحِيحٍ authentic chain of narration, that Uthman used to say, لَا تُكَلِّفُ الْأَمَتَ don't force a woman غَيْرَ ذَاتِ الصَّنْعَةِ الْكَسْبَةِ A woman, don't force her in a profession that she doesn't know very well. Don't force her into doing it. فَإِنَّكُمْ مَتَى كَلَفْتُمُوهَا Whenever you burden a woman in going out to look for money, ذَلِكَ كَسَبَتْ بِفَرْجِهَا She might go and do prostitution. It might force her to do prostitution and make money from zina. She might think, okay, this is the easiest way to make it. So don't burden the women. Don't burden. وَلِذَلِكَ Islam doesn't request money from women. They're the ones who are funded. While she's with her father, her father pays for everything for her. And then her husband. And then if her, her children, when they grow up, they look after her. A woman is always like that. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith, which Imam Ahmad narrated in his Musnad, and the hadith is ala shart al-shaykhain, that the Prophet prohibited Three types of income. The first one is kasbul hajami, the money that is made by the person who does hijama. The second one is wa kasbil baghi, and the money that's made from a a prostitute. The third one is wa tamanul kalbi, the money that's made from dogs, selling or buying dogs. So it's prohibited. So these were things that were very common. Also, wa'dul banati, that girls will be buried alive. That was common. That the Arabs would do that. They would bury their daughters alive. And the women were the lowest looked at. As Allah said in the Quran, وَإِذَا بُشِّرْ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنثَى If one of them, his wife, she gives birth to a girl, the minute the news is given to him, his face will become darkened. The first thing that he thinks about is, where am I going to bury her? How am I going to face the community? What am I going to say to the people? That my wife, after nine months of pregnancy, she gave birth to a girl? That's what he's thinking about. Not the name that he's going to give his daughter and how he's, and her clothing. He's worrying about how he's going to get rid of her and destroy her. So this was very common. They would kill the, their daughters and they would bury them alive. Some of them would take their daughters whilst they are daddy, daddy, they would bury them alive and put them in their graves. Ibn Sa'ad Sa Sa brings it in his tabaqat, many stories. But because they're not authentic, we're not going to mention it. But the reality is that they did do that. They also killed their children out of poverty. If they had no money, they would kill their children. And if they were able to sell them, they will also, they will also sell them. And sometimes they would even make a promise to Allah. If their children become ten, they would slaughter one of them. And that's what was done to the Prophet's father. Abdullahi. Abdullahi. We're going to see that later, inshallah, the Prophet's father. Abdul Muttalib, what did, he, what did he want to do? Abdul Muttalib wanted to. He wanted, he had 10 boys. And he promised Allah, if you give me 10, I will slaughter one for you. And so he took the. And then he placed a uh, qura. Uh, he threw a lot. And it kept coming up for the Prophet's father. He didn't like that for it to happen to the Prophet's father. Because the Prophet's father was most beloved to him, Abdul Muttalib. Are you there? Well, the ulama, they say that the Prophet ﷺ came from the two individuals who were going to be slaughtered. Ismail and Abdullah. Ismail is the Prophet ﷺ's what? His lineage is from. And that's Nabiullah Ismail, the son of Ibrahim. 
and Abdullah, the Prophet's father. So that's what they used to do. They will make a promise with Allah and they will kill their children. Also, they were very, very, very excessive in their killing. Why was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent in the Arabian Peninsula? Why was he sent amongst the Arabs? A people like this that you mentioned, why them? Why out of all people was it them? Number one, the Arabs, they were upon the fitrah though. They were upon the fitrah, meaning the basic instinct. They were not a people who the philosophy of the philosophers entered them. All of this which they were doing was out of ignorance. And if anything came to them, they were willing to accept it. Whereas the other civilizations, they were full of themselves and they believe knowledge has come to them. So which one is easier to empty a cup and then pour something into it or to just get an uh, empty cup and pour something in there? And so the Arabs were like that. And the evidence for that is when Sahal ibn Amr, pay attention to this. Who was Sahal ibn Amr? In Hudaybiyah, the treaty of Hudaybiyah, we're going to take that in details, inshallah ta'ala. Sahal ibn Amr was the man who signed the treaty with the Prophet when the Prophet was stopped from entering Mecca. And don't worry, we're going to come to that incident very well, inshallah ta'ala. Sahal ibn Amr, when the Prophet wrote, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Min Muhammad Rasulillah. He said to him, don't write that. I'm a, he, the Prophet wrote, Hada ma qada bihi Muhammad Rasulullah. So he said to him, Sahal ibn Amr said to him, Wallahi by Allah, law kunna na'lamu annaka Rasulullah, if we believed you were a messenger from Allah, ma saddadnaak anil bayti wa la qatalnaak. We will not have stopped you from entering Mecca, nor would we have fought against you all this time. We don't believe you're a Prophet sent from Allah. This is Sahal ibn Amr, right? When Sahal ibn Amr took Islam, just to show you the fitrah, when Sahal ibn Amr took Islam, the one who said to the Prophet, فَأَوَّلُ مَنْ أُخَاصِمُكَ بِي The first person I'm going to judge with you on the treaty of Hudaybiyah is my son, Abu Jandal, give him to me. And he signed a hard contract with the Prophet. Sah? When he took Islam, what did he become? كَانَ كَثِيرَ الصَّلَاةِ His salah was excessive. والصوم, he used to fast Mondays and Thursdays. والصدقه, he would give charity excessively. وكان كثير البكاء, he used to cry excessively whenever he would hear the Quran. And he used to say, والله by Allah, لا أدع موقفا مع المشركين إلا وقفت مع المسلمين مثله. والله, there's no, never going to come a position where the Muslims need me to stay, stand harsh against the disbelievers except I will stand shoulder to shoulder with my brothers from the Muslims against the disbelievers, I promise you. And I've never ever given charity before Islam in support of the disbelievers. I'm going to give the same for Islam and the Muslims now. Why? Just, in, just hope, inshallah ta'ala, that the wrong that I've done, this would overcome it. And this would, inshallah ta'ala, allow me to get a high place in Jannah. So this is what they were, their hearts. And that's why the Prophet came from these people. The second thing is, their hearts were pure. The Arabs, they had a very pure heart. These, they were upon the fitrah, and this one is a slight difference. Which is, their problem was shahawat. Desires is what they had. They weren't a people who suffered from shubuhat, doubts. In the sense where they knew nothing. No one from the civilizations of that time ever wanted to invade the Arab world. They were barbaric. They weren't seen as anything. They had no form of taqaddum. Uh, they were just nothing. There was nothing to be said about them. And that's why a lot of this 
uh, countries of that time, the Persians and the Romans, they couldn't accept these Bedouins. <coughs> like we were there. How did this happen? And these civilizations are talking back at Christianity time and how that works. So this is how they were. Their jahl was jahl, which is basir. Their arguments were very simple. Their arguments were very, very simple. And it was very easy. The third one was that the Arabs were very direct people. They weren't people beat behind bushes. They will never deceive. If they loved you, they loved you. And if they didn't, they didn't love you. That was their characteristics. And you would all know the position the Ans Muhajirin took, uh, sorry, the Ansar took when they gave the Prophet the Bay'ah. And they Aus and Khazraj were the two biggest tribes from Ansar, right? They met the Prophet in Aqaba. And they gave the Prophet Bay'ah. Al-Abbas ibn Ubadat ibn Nadlat al-Khazraji, look what he said to them before the Bay'ah. He said, Ya Ma'ashar al-Khazraj. O oh, people of Khazraj. Do you guys know what Muhammad is asking for as a bay'ah? He loves the Prophet. But he really wants them to know what they're getting themselves into. So they don't get co-feated later. And they get worried and scared. He said, are you guys fully aware of the pledge of allegiance that you're taking with the Prophet? What it entails? What is it going to lead to? Do you know? قَالُوا نَعَمْ he said, they said yes. He said, إِنَّكُمْ تُبَايِعُونَهُ Muhammad's bay'ah that you're giving him, this pledge of allegiance, is that عَلَىٰ حَرْبِ الْأَحْمَرِ وَالْأَسْوَدِ بِلَا النَّاسِ That you're going to fight every nation out there is going to fight you guys. The minute you proclaim the message he's calling to, the world is your enemy. And you're going to be fighting with those people. Then they, and then, then, then they responded, قَالُوا فَمَا لَنَا بِذَلِكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ نَحْنُ وَافَيْنَا They looked at the Prophet, they said, Ya Rasulullah, if that statement, we fulfill it, and we stick by it, and we stand shoulder to shoulder with you, what do we receive? The Prophet said, Al-Jannah. Allah will give you guys Jannah. And then they said to the Prophet, أُبْسُطْ يَدَكَ Open your hand. فَبَسْطَ يَدَهُ The Prophet opened his hand, they gave him a pledge of allegiance, one after the other. One man comes, he gives, he moves on. The next one. And guess what? When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Battle of Badr, and we're going to talk about that in details. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who did he consult? <coughs> the Battle of Badr didn't happen in a planned way. It wasn't organized, it wasn't prepared. But the Prophet knew that the greatest casualty are going to be who? Ansar. Ansar are the people of Medina. And if bloodshed takes place, the people who are going to suffer the most, who are going to have the most casualties, are the Ansar. So the Prophet kept asking, what do you guys think we should do here, in this situation? And then the Muhajirin were talking. And then the Prophet kept looking at the Ansar, like, can you guys talk? It's you guys. And so then they... Sa'ad ibn Ubadah stood up. I think it was him. He stood up. He said, Ya Rasulullah, ka'annaka turiduna. It's like you want us. The Prophet said, yes. Yeah, I want you guys to talk. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we're not going to say to you what Musa's people said to him. Idhab anta wa rabbuka faqatila inna hauna qa'idun. You and your people fight and we wait here for the results. We won't say that to you. You know what we're going to say to you? Idhab anta wa rabbuka faqatila. You and your Lord go and fight. Fa inna ma'akuma muqatilun. We're going to fight shoulder to shoulder with you. Like today, Muhammad, we're with you. Wherever you want to go and whatever you want to do, we're with you. And they fulfilled that covenant and that promise that they made with him, alayhi salatu wasalam. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, when Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, فَوَالَّذِي بَعَتَكَ بِالْحَقِّ I swear by the Lord. This is his speech, he's still carrying on. لَوْ اسْتَعَرَضْتَ بِنَا الْبَحْرِ If you tell us, Walk in that ocean. All of you guys, walk. Just walk inside the ocean. La khudna ma'aka. Wallahi, we're going to cut it with you. Ma takhalla fa minna rajulun wahid. 
Not one man from amongst us is going to hold back. We promise you that. And was it, was it just a speech or did they really do that? They really, really did that. And that is a distinct characteristic that the Arabs were known for. They were a people, they gave you their words, you will never have to come back to them on that again. That's it. The other reason why they were chosen was because the Arabs were a people who grew up in hard life. They were not Adawa'il Madaniyati wa Tarafi. They weren't like the Persians and the Romans who were born in pa ca castles and palaces and. La, la, la. They were people who were born under trees. Livestock and camels was their life. They were strong type of people. Huh? They didn't grow up on chicken and chips. Yeah? They were strong people. They were courageous. The Prophet's armor, do you know how much one armor weighed? He had two armors put together. You know that, right? How much was one? Yeah, it was 50 kg. 50. His armor weighed, alayhi salatu wasalam. Are you with me, brothers? His sword. Hadith wala haraj. Something else. So the issue is also the Arabs were truthful people. They were truthful. And they were people who could be trusted. And they were very courageous, brave people. Nifaq and hypocrisy was not in their list. If they were going to kill a tribe, they will tell that tribe, we're going to kill you. We're coming for you. We broke the covenant. We're coming for you. Deception wasn't part of their deal. Well, then you can guess, imagine this. They used to have, before Islam, they had a characteristic which was, within the year, there was a period of time in which there was no fight that was meant to happen. It was, uh, and Islam adopted that from them and he took it on. Ashhurul Hurum is taken from them. They just used to play around with it. They used to sometimes push it forward and backwards. But those months were there. If it entered, and it happened that the month entered, and they all knew it was the time, guess what they would do? You would walk in front of the man whose father you killed, and he won't touch you. You just killed his father. And the Ashhurul Hurum just came in. You walk in front of him and he cannot say a thing to you. He won't touch you. He will wait for the time to come back. For what? That's how they were. Ahlul Sitq. They had these characteristics. They were very brave. Deception and was not part of their characteristics. The sixth thing that they were very well known is they were people who knew how to fight. They knew what? They knew very, very well how to fight. Fighting was their characteristics, their norms. And that's what they talk about. Riding horses, for instance. Archery and all of this was their norms. The other characteristics that the Arabs had was that Kanu, they were a people who did not like to be subjugated. Oppression and vulm. They didn't accept that. They were people who loved to live free. And Islam is compatible with the people like that. A people who want to live freedom. Because Islam brings you out of the shackles of slavery for people. <laughs> Islam came to take you out of the shackles of slavery for the human beings. To become a slave of who? Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah ta'ala, it's nine o'clock now, five past nine. We will conclude there inshallah ta'ala. Um, and we'll carry on next Saturday bi ibnillah al kareem The time is going to be moved inshallah ta'ala at 7.30, so it's going to move forward. So we can start the class straight away after it. 
Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is for me, Shaytan, and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayhi.